Welcome to another episode of the Balance Advisor Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Travis Perry. Today, we have Jesse Hurst. Jesse majored in finance, University of Akron. Jesse began his career as a financial advisor in 1987. He became a founding partner of Millennial Group in 97, where he focused on helping people successfully pursue their retirement goals. After founding Impel in 2017, Jesse developed a partnership with Horizon Advisor Network, a national enterprise group providing regulatory and operational support to over 50 advisors and 16 offices across the country. He also leads the network's investment management committee. Jesse, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me today. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. This is a pleasure to have you. I know you've got several accolades and awards and we spent a bunch of time before this uh, podcast doing the pre-show and getting to know each other. Um, you know, and I'm impressed with your story, impressed with the originality of your direction, but let's talk about that. Let's talk about direction. How'd you get in this industry? How did you get started? And, and what led you to eventually, uh, you know, founding Impel? Yeah. So it's, I'll try to keep this brief because there's lots of fun twists and turns along the way, but you know, I don't know if any of you, any of you are old enough to remember a TV show back in the 1980s called um, called uh, Family Ties, and the person, the person who was the main character in there was a was a person called Alex P. Keaton, and I I admired Alex P. Keaton, man. Alex P. Keaton was about banking and finance and investments and so forth, and that's where I always pictured myself going. So. I, um, when I was in college, I had to work my way through college the first two years at the University of Akron. I actually loaded and unloaded trucks. My last two years, I became a uh, bank teller at uh, Huntington National Bank. And realizing after seeing my branch manager who had been there for 25 years, uh, realizing what he made, I realized I'd never be able to provide for a family if I was stayed at the bank. I answered an ad for, uh, I answered an ad for John Hancock, who was trying to start a financial planning division. They had hired a certified financial planner, and they called it their real life, real answers division. And, um, you know, I told Travis story in the pre-show, but, uh, you know, the the old line kind of uh, longtime life insurance agent who was interviewing me asked me why I wanted to pursue a career selling life insurance. And I said that I really had no intention of pursuing a career selling life insurance. And he looked at me and said, well, why are you here? And I said, well, I thought you guys were starting a financial planning division and that uh, if I could make a career out of helping people solve their financial problems, that that would probably be rewarding to me and to my clients. And for some reason, they took a flyer and, and hired me and I was there for about two years before I moved over to an independent financial planning firm that I was with for about seven years. In 1997, myself and two other partners who were 48 and 44 years old, I was 31 at the time, uh, started a firm that was folk called Millennial Group. It was all around Y2K and turn of the millennium that was really focused on helping corporate America mostly people in corporate greater Akron area. You know, we have a lot of big corporations that were headquartered here, a lot of the rubber tire industry and so forth, make, you know, accumulate the resources necessary to be able to make a successful transition from work life to retirement life. And so I was a partner in that firm for 20 years. And then in 2016, 2017, my oldest partner was retiring out and moving, moving on into retirement life himself and the other partner and I had the opportunity, our practices had kind of moved in different directions. So we had the opportunity to form Impel Wealth Management. We chose the name Impel because uh, Impel means to impart motion towards a future goal or future destination or to give somebody the confidence to move forward. And we thought that fit really well with what we did. Uh, the only other thing I'd say about that is Impel, there's also there were only like three other companies in the world and none of them had anything else to do with the financial services world that had Impel as part of their name. So when you typed in Impel, you went right to the straight, straight to the top of Google search. Love it. Smart. Uh, the the uh, actual 
progress you've made, you know, from insurance agent to, you know, independent to starting your own firm, uh, is, is a natural one. And I feel like, as I, I, I was there as a young advisor, wanting to be independent, having that ability, I think a lot of advisors want flexibility. They want the freedom to do what they can for their clients and for their schedules. And they, they really do get paid well. You know, they want the, the financial aspect, the three F's we call them for you as you've been building this firm really from transition to transition. And, you know, you have a family we've talked about, you have three children, you're married. So I mean, you're balancing the work life with, uh, with your employees and advisors. And you also have, you know, a very important role there as father and husband. What is your definition of balance that's kept you in the game here? Yeah, I don't know that I have a, a firm definition as much as I kind of have like what a picture of what it looks like in my head, right? So for me, for me, um, balance really uh, is focused around a few things. Number one is uh, trying to take care of your health right? I'm a morning workout person. I get up around five o'clock each morning and between five and, and six 30, I, I, you know, answer emails. I do my, my prayer reflection time, uh, make sure I'm prepared for the day at six 30, I'm hitting the gym. And at 56 years old, I don't do the same workouts today that I did when I was 35, but some combination of, of weightlifting Peloton and yoga, you know, we try to take care of, because if you're, if we're not healthy, we can't take, it's kind of like a sponge, right? If, if, if we're constantly being run dry and we're not taking time to reabsorb and refill ourselves, we can't be any good to help anybody else. So that, that's a focus for me. I know I feel better when I work out first thing in the morning. And then, you know, it comes down to managing your calendar, right? So, so for me, I have about 150 client families that I work with. I see almost all of those clients twice a year, every six months. So actually it's like going to the dentist, right? When clients leave, they schedule their next six month meeting. But then we also know that every year we have a number of clients going through transitions, retirement transitions, inheritance, you know, different, different life experiences. And sometimes we'll see a client three, four or five times in a year I schedule 400 client slots a year. So I schedule, I, I basically schedule nine to 10 a week, uh, you know, 42 weeks a year. That gives me four to five weeks a year to do conference and continuing education. It gives me 40, four to five weeks, hopefully soon to be six weeks or more of travel vacation and experiencing life and creating memories and shared experiences with my wife and family which we think is really important. We think actually, and we talk with a lot of our clients about this, we think the value of shared experience and memories actually goes up over time while the value of stuff goes down over time. And that's a really important, you know, kind of tenant in that process. So if I've got 150 client families, I know between taking care of them and the extra meetings that will be there, 350 of my 400 slots are filled up on day one. So my staff guards the other 50 with their life. And like literally if, and I, I hate to, to challenge Travis on this, but like if they didn't know who you were and you called my office, you couldn't get to me. Right. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know what I should tell this story, but like, but like about 12 years ago, I was on an elevator in Atlanta at a conference. I was speaking at a conference. I had my name badge on and I got on the elevator at the 15th floor and at the 12th floor, the elevator opened and this guy got on and he looked at my name pad name badge. And he goes, you're Jesse Hurst. And I said, yeah, I said, have I met you before? He goes, I'm the Invesco wholesaler that's called your office three times a month for the last two years trying to get in and I've never been able to talk to you. And I looked at him, I said, well, the system works. You've got 12 floors, go. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so that's part of it. And then making sure you take time to plan the family uh, goals and objectives that you have. And it's one of the things Rochelle and I've been really intentional about every year we put together our one, three and five year 
health, faith, family, travel, experience, and educational goals. And it's really fun to look back on them and be able to say, check, check, check. And there's things you didn't get, but, but you know, you get more of them than you think if you, you know, if you're intentional about doing that. What I love about your process is, is the intentionality, right? You're not reactive. You're very much proactive about what it is you want to do, how you want to do it, and you're after it. And, you know, there's a lot of advisors who claim that, you know, I, you know, I want to be proactive. I want to get stuff done and I'm helping my clients do my goals, but they're not doing it for themselves. Yeah. So kudos to you. Also, you know, I've, I've noticed that a lot of advisors really struggle taking vacation. Uh, Kitsis Institute, they did a research study specifically on this question. And there was a recent article written um, discussing how a lot of advisors really struggle kind of in this, this mid group turn, you know, size of, of group where if they leave their business, typically they don't feel refreshed. They're not, you know, um, getting the refill that you mentioned, you know, their canteen is dry. Um, and for, you know, I like that analogy that you got to keep filling it up yet. They don't view travel vacation as something that's helpful because when they're on vacation, they tend to be not present with their family or at the conferences, they've got their laptops up, but they're working. Yeah. <laughs> like, what's right. the point? You Are you there? You're not really there. We struggle with being present, don't we? We struggle as a society. What has well, been a secret I, for I you? actually think, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry to jump in no, there, but you're I, good. I think it's one of the biggest struggles that came out of COVID, right? Because when you went to a conference, if you flew to Denver for a conference, you were actually there and present and in a room. And you maybe have your laptop or your iPod, your iPad open, but you have conversations in the halls and you're meeting people and so forth. When you're on a, on a virtual conference, it's very easy to be answering emails and checking your schedule and following up on this or that and so forth. So I think there is a large component of humanity that was of the human side of our business that was lost through the connections during COVID and virtual, uh, virtual platforms. Yeah. And that's really good. Great point. Um, cause now we're multitasking and it's such a different level. We're pretending we're actually there when we're not present. It's hard enough as it is. Cause we don't talk very fast. Well, unless you're a really fast talker, like I'm trying to do right now, like if you can do four to 500 words a minute, like we tend to be more focused. But if I'm talking really slow, the human brain, you're already thinking three other things right now, right? Because we're talking so slow. So it's it's a difficult thing. And, and, and social media, all, all these advertisers know that. Quick, simple, bring attention right away, uh, make it controversial, like all those things that, that uh, it, we'll get into in just a little bit about content are really super important right now for advisors if they're going to get you know attention and, uh, and, and, re, and re keep that attention, their marketing as they're scaling. So as we're talking about scaling, what have you noticed has been a, a really great strength for you as you've been able to start scaling your business, growing your firms, but not losing that balance, not losing those four to five, six weeks of vacation that you really value the time spent with your family. What, what has been something that you've done or feel like, yeah, this has really worked to keep that balance while you're growing? Yeah. So I would say there's, there's uh, three things in particular. Number one is, is when, when we formed Impel Wealth Management five years ago, you know, I've been used to being part of a team that had three partners and different people did different things and so forth. And I knew what my part was that I enjoyed doing, which was managing the investment committee and creating content for our marketing and so forth. But operations, payroll, compliance, all that IT is not my giftedness or strength, nor am I really interested in it. So when we formed Impel Wealth Management, I made a, a firm decision to outsource anything that I'm not good at or is not the highest and best use of my time. So I have an outsourced HR uh, person. It's actually, and I hope this doesn't sound like too much nepotism, but actually my wife was an HR director for, she worked with Coca-Cola. She worked with Compass Real Estate. She worked for GE. 
about eight years ago, I talked her into starting her own HR recruiting consulting company. So Impel Wealth is one of her clients. So she does all of my outsourced uh, HR. She does our, our employee manual. She does our benefits. She does our payroll, all of that stuff, right? I have an IT company that I outsource everything to on information technology and my, my IT infrastructure. I have a marketing public relations firm that helps me set strategic marketing goals, build our budgets and our tactics. And then they do, they create ads and copy and so forth. I write our blog posts and I do our videos, but they, they do that. And then I have somebody on my team who does kind of the day-to-day -day implementation of that. And then this kind of dovetails into point number two, which is I didn't want to be an island under myself. So um, I looked at a number of networks. I looked at Carson. I looked at a couple of other bigger groups. And we decided to join Horizon Advisor Network. So Impel Wealth Management is one of 21 offices of Horizon Advisor Network. It's about 65 financial advisors overseeing about three and a half billion dollars of assets. So they do all of my outsourced uh, compliance regulatory operational support. I pay them uh, a certain percentage fee to do that. And then I don't have to worry about that. I've got the best people in the country doing that for me. And now we've got the, we've really got kind of the um, autonomy of our own clients, our own service model, my own service team and our own PL, but we've got the scale and resources of a big national group. So we've kind of got the best of both worlds. And then the last thing I would say is we've been very intentional about scaling and automating and building systems into everything. So even though there's three advisors in my firm, myself and two other certified financial planners, there's one way we build financial plans. There's one way, there's one set of portfolio models that we use. There's one way we do client onboarding or, or marketing or whatever it is so that it is the Impel Wealth experience, not the Jesse, Nathan, or Irene experience. So whether, it, whether we grow to five, seven, 10 advisors over time, we can scale and replicate that, that process. Nuggets right there. Talk about roles, who's doing what, you know, and, and knowing where you work best. I call it the work sweet spot. When you're in your yeah. work sweet spot, you are productive and you love it. Like it's, it's, it is both. Uh, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're doing well and you, and you, you like what you're doing. You mentioned, you know, this is a struggle. Number two is a struggle where a lot of advisors, if they go independent, they feel like, well, now I am an Island. Right. And so there's Napa, there's XYPN, there's uh, Carson Horizon Advisor Network. I could go on. There's a lot of these great, you know, places to tap into. I remember going independent, having that experience, and deciding, no, I wanted a network of people to be a part of, and that's exactly it. Like you, you can have the, the autonomy, and you can have the resources, which I, I love what you're doing there. And it also speaks to the outsourcing, right? It speaks to you know, do the things that you do really well, and let others take that. Um, and then this one's really interesting because scaling and automating, we talk about this all the time on the show. Um, you know, you really are the first one I've, I've interviewed thus far saying, hey, we have one way of doing it, period, end of story. It is sort of like the franchising model, right? No, this is how you make a burger. No, this is exactly how you cut, you know, this slice of bacon or whatever it, <laughs> the production item is. Right. For 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 you guys, that's super important. You know, standard operating procedures that that uh, really productive scaled businesses have. Good yep. job on that. It sounds awesome. What do you think as you're as you're trying to keep your balance and stay in your own role um, and managing the scaling? What's some of the biggest struggles that you find in doing this and not being tempted to lose this balance or let the health slide or relationships wane? Yeah, yeah, there's a couple of things there. That's a great question. And, you know, if I went back, so I, I was president of the Northeast Ohio Financial Planning Association uh, back when the old ICFP merged with the old IAFP, I, I became the, the first chapter president of Northeast Ohio. And I remember sitting at, a, at an event 
And this is in the days before you could do CE online, right? You had to go to these meetings to get your, your continuing education credits. And I'm sitting at a round table. And I remember I, at that time, I said something about, I had about 275 client families that I worked with. And the guy who was next to me from AG Edwards, which doesn't even exist anymore, uh, said, well, that's nothing. I've got over 400 client families. And the guy who was next to him from Merrill Lynch said, well, that's nothing. I've got over 800 client families. And the guy who was next to him from Edward Jones said, well, that's nothing. I've got over 1,100 client families. And I remember thinking, you might have 1,100 accounts, but you don't have 1,100 relationships. You don't have the time, energy, uh, space on the mental shelf to invest in that many people to be able to do it or do it well. So one of the things that I've, that I've worked really hard on is today I have about 150 client families that I work with. Uh, my goal is to get to 100 over the next five years. And some of that will be um, through continuing to upscale my clients and take some of the less complex cl uh, clients and work with my associate wealth advisors. Uh, some of that, I hate to say this, but when you work with clients who are 55 to 85, some of it's just natural attrition that happens, um, but that's just the fact of life. And, and so it's, it's really, my goal is to have fewer clients that I service really well and make sure that we use our marketing, branding, social media platforms and so forth to continue to fill the pipe but do it primarily for my next generation of advisors that are coming in. Not only is that smart scaling, uh, but it's the exit, you know, in the, in the, in the view, um, it's really great planning to do it that way. Um, so true. Uh, when we try to manage relationships, I mean, again, you can build out a great team and you can offload relationships to the rest of your team. But there is a there's a tap on as you personally being able to handle everything about a client's you know situation. Um, Eleven hundred, it just sounds like the one upmanship that sometimes exists a little too much in this industry, right? Of like, yeah. oh, that's nothing, well, that's nothing. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think, quite honestly, that's one of the biggest issues I see financial advisors dealing with is the ego. Yeah, um, this is this is an ego driven, ego rewarded industry. In that, again, it's the financial piece. We are paid really well uh, when we're able to make it and get, and get there and, and create these businesses. Yet, that's also part of the reason why I describe in the book Achieving Balance. There is a workaholic trap. It just sucks oh, yeah. us in. You know. Yeah, I could. I could very easily. I'll, I'll tell you what. This you might find this kind of funny. I had a guy in 1987 when I started with John Hancock who actually said to me. He said, the secret to this business is longevity. He said, and I had no idea what he was. I had no context, no clue for what he was saying. But he said, if he said, if you can make it 10 years, he said, the first five years in this business, you will be horribly overworked and underpaid. Now, again, this is back in the days where you ate what you killed, right? There was you worked on commissions and 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 nobody was paying you a salary and giving you clients and so forth. It was all personal business development. But then he said, year six through 10, you'll be horribly overworked and reasonably paid. And if you make it to year 11, you can be overpaid the rest of your life. And he said, the problem is most people don't make it to year 11, right? And so that was kind of interesting. The one other thing I wanted to bring up that I think is kind of unique in our industry and this is, this is a work-life challenge thing, is when markets are up and clients are doing well and they see their account values up, you know, you look at 2019, early 2020 before COVID hit, first of all, they're not calling, they're not concerned, they don't have questions. When you're doing uh, client education events or webinars or whatever, your attendance is low because they're not concerned. Everything's doing great. I'm fine. And you're making more money than you've ever made. And you're not having to work that hard at that moment. But you go through a period like COVID or you go through a period like now or you go through a period like 07, 08. And I'm old enough to remember a few before that. Right. You're working harder than you've ever worked at a time when your asset bases drop, your revenues drop. 
and you need your team, you can't reduce staff because you've got to service your clients like crazy. So it's, it's a weird business that when things are up and things are easy, you're making more money and not working that hard. And the reverse is true during difficult times. Yeah. And you mentioned this that I've heard several times. And I mean, I was even recruited on this idea. You just got to make it to 10 years. Right. And, and I decided I was going to figure out, well, if I'm underpaid, I'm just gonna be more productive. I'm not going to be overworked. <laughs> I'm going to have that balance. And so, so many who are coming into this industry, um, they're struggling with that, you know, and now I've seen a switch, a change in the culture of this business, this industry, where a lot of guys like you and gals who are, you know, starting their own wealth management firms are creating a culture that's more conducive to balance because of pay, because it's not just eat what you kill. Good luck. I mean, I was 22 for crying out loud when I started, you know, selling, uh, you know, financial planning. Um, yeah, there was life insurance involved and, you know, there's some commissions and, and I eventually evolved into to being an a, a independent advisor. But the reality was it's exactly it. You're way overworked if you let it. Now, what I find is advisors 10 years later, they actually haven't left that mentality because it's so ingrained. They're getting paid more, but they feel like they should still be working more and they end up stuck in that trap. And what happens, like you just mentioned, is that when things are up, it's easy. Um, but then when things are down, there is this stress factor. It's the stress factor. If, if I don't answer every email right away or every phone call or et cetera, that my clients will leave me. It, it tends to be more out of fear um, where, you know, great advisors like yourself, you know, you're training your clients, you're teaching them these times will come. And yes, this is how we're going to help you uh, because the, every five years, Nick Murray says, you know, the, the market, you know, it takes a drop. <laughs> well, and every, every, you know, one of the things we're very intentional with, and because we do a lot of retirement planning work for corporate executives, a lot of our clients come to us when they're in their early mid fifties and they're trying to figure out the retirement roadmap, right? Or the flight plan. And they want to know if they've got enough fuel in the tank to make that successful transition from work life to retirement life. And they don't know, maybe they haven't even defined where they want to land and they have no idea how much fuel they need to get there. But because a lot of those clients just stick with us for 15, 20, 25, 30 years, I have clients that have been with me for more than 30 years now. We have a lot of clients that are 55 to 85 years old. And so one of the things that we've done is, is we are very intentional for our clients who are taking regular income, systematic withdrawals, required minimum distributions from their retirement accounts or from their investment accounts to supplement pensions and social security is every time it's been more than six months and the market hits a new all-time high, we go into all of our model portfolios and we shave a little bit off the top and we refill their cash buckets so that they're at least 12 to 24 months ahead in their liquidity needs and you make money by buying low and selling high. And sometimes when the markets are going up, clients are like, well, why are you taking money out? Everything's doing so great. And you know, we sit here and go, in the last four years now, we had almost a 20% downturn September to December of 18. We had the 34% downturn during COVID. Now we're down 22% during this time period. And so again, going back to training your clients, they know we don't, we're not getting panic phone calls right now because they know they don't have to worry about it. We've got enough liquidity to cover them for the next two, three years, and they can turn off the TV, go, go play golf, go play with their grandkids. And that's part of the discipline is making sure clients understand and are trained that way. Well said. And this idea of rebalancing portfolios, you know, being proactive about the goals, it's not just you know, set it, forget it and move on. But it's true financial planning, uh, at least wealth management aspect you've discussed here. So incredibly important that we do that work for them because that's what they hire us to do. Right now, yeah. you know, there's so much out there. There's news, there's blogs, there's articles from advisors. And a lot of times some, it's just some of the same stuff is being rehashed. What I noticed about 
uh, you, Jesse, is that you're very creative and uh, transparent with your ideas and thoughts. You take pop culture and you mix it in your blog posts with education, which is a breath of fresh air. Um, I can't tell you how many times I, I'm connected with over 6,000 financial advisors on LinkedIn. And sometimes I'm like, oh, today New York Life dropped their one article because everybody copied and pasted. And, you know, that's not the thing for you. And you've been, done such a great job building up your blog, creating content to be a thought leader. How has that helped you to scale? Well, I think from a scale, from a, it, it's helped us with developing the funnel of new clients, which allows me to continue to build new prospects into the funnel for my two associate wealth advisors. And then I hate to say this, but like, I kind of cherry pick the top ones, right? The ones that, that fit kind of my unique um, value proposition of what I'm good at doing and what I like doing. So last year, Nathan and I, when it was just the two of us, we had 42 new referrals last year. That resulted in 26 new clients. And um, of those 26 new clients, I took five. Nathan took 21, right? We added Irene to our team in January of this year. And so far through the first five months of the year, we've had 35 new referrals. And so we're, and we know that every time there's dislocation, volatility, uh, geopolitical uncertainty, inflation, whatever it is, money goes in motion because people who, who thought it was easy, thought they could do it themselves, realize there's more complexity to this process and there's more moving parts and they start seeking second opinion, seeking help and looking for that. So what we do with our blog posts, and I love writing, I have fun doing it. I have ideas pop in my mind uh, for, for whether it's movies or music or, or whatever, right? Like I wrote a blog post earlier this year. Uh, everybody saw that the Fed was going to start raising interest rates. And I had a few people say to me, oh, well, the Fed's going to start raising interest rates, so inflation's going to come down. And I started thinking about the lag in monetary policy to, to the Fed raises interest rates now, and six to nine months later, this starts working its way through the economy. So the first thing that popped into my head was the Tom Petty song, The Waiting is the Hardest Part, right? And we, we wrote a blog post called The Waiting is the Hardest Part. I used parts of the lyrics from the song and some different things to relate an economic idea that people could re, could understand because it wasn't just dry numbers and economics and statistics. So trying to have some fun with it, we post the blog, we put it out on Facebook and LinkedIn to read the rest that we put a teaser paragraph. The to read the rest of it, they have to click the link which drives traffic back to our website where there's a call to action. And then I truly believe that part of what we're gifted to do is to help more people. And so driving the activity gives us the ability and, and bringing in Nathan four years ago and Irene in January. Now it's not just Jesse, it's, it's our team is here to serve. And, and I tell people it's, it's not just a calling, it's almost a ministry for us. Yeah, fantastic. It's very unique what you're doing uh, because again, Advisors say, I don't have time. I don't have expertise. I can't be creative like this. Uh, I would disagree. Like we all have something, whether it's drawings, um, whether it is, you know, blog articles, if it's video, you need to develop content. Uh, yeah, of course, compliance approved, depending on <laughs> how you're all set up and everything. Um, and some of you may be limited, but even if it's a copy and paste blog article into your approved social networking you know, account, at least put your two cents and at least give a personal opinion, add a comment, ask people to comment on it. Uh, the more that you're able to identify this concept, make it your own and m help your ideal clients to understand the, the, the information that's coming out, they're going to see you as a leader. What advice uh, would you give to advisors out there? You've talked about some, some struggles you had, some strengths, what you're doing to really grow and scale the business and build this team um, from, from the blog and the marketing aspects. But 
advisors are out there, maybe they're struggling with any one of these issues. What advice would you leave them with, Jesse, is some words of wisdom of how to scale without losing your balance? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I think the first thing is, is try to understand your unique giftedness, right? What is it? It's hard. You know, I heard I heard Ron Carson say one time years ago, and I've known Ron for 20 years. And he said, you know, a lot of times people say, work on your weaknesses so you'll be better at them. And, he, and then, then you'll have strong weaknesses. And that seems crazy, right? It's like, let's find our unique giftedness. Let's find our passion, find what we're good at, and then hire or contract out the things you're not good at. And I'm a huge believer in that. And, and just because I like running our investment committee, I, I like economics and investment research, and I like writing uh, and doing videos and stuff. That's, that's my wheelhouse, right? That's what I like doing. That may be very different for the next three advisors, but whatever their unique area is, I think they need to focus on that. And then really serving with excellence the clients that you, you don't have to serve everybody, right? Uh, you just have to serve the best pe the, the people who, I find that people opt in when there's a connection and you build a, a, a client base of people who resonate with who you are, what your message is. And I tell people this in an initial meeting, right? I'll, I'll say, you know, um, if we spend, you know, an hour, an hour and a half together, and it doesn't look like a really good fit from both sides of the table, no's an okay answer for either of us. And it's funny when you say that to somebody who, who walks in the door with the perception that they're interviewing you, and now they realize you're interviewing them as well, it changes the dynamic of the meeting because it now it now it tells them that, oh, I might not get in the club. Oh, there's an exclusivity to this, right? And they don't take just anybody and everybody. And I think over time, people who like you, like your process, like your message, like the communication strategy and so forth, you tend to, those people tend to gravitate towards you. So I think there's that. And then I think the last thing would really be just planning your schedule, planning your calendar a year in advance. Here's how many slots I have. Here's where I'm going to put in for family. Here's where I'm going to put in for health. Here's where I'm going to put in for vacation. And then sticking to it, right? You have to treat that like that, like that time with my wife, whether it was in 2019 when we took two weeks in Northern Italy, right? Or, you know, don't tell anybody I said this, but next on Sunday, my wife turns 55. And on, on next week, we're flying to West Palm Beach for a week for her birthday. And that's, that's been in my calendar for, for eight or nine months. And one of the things that I have to do intentionally is because when clients leave, they schedule their next six month meeting from now, my personal and family time has to be scheduled more than six months in advance and blocked off in my calendar or else it might not happen. And, and it's priority for it too. Yeah. Great nuggets there. I appreciate the advice, you know, stick to it. I mean, that's what I'm getting from you is just be, um, we're so easily, cause we want to help. Uh, we're so easily able to stick to a, an appointment if someone else schedules it with us, right? Clients, teammates, et cetera. But there's something about that personal integrity that you mentioned, Jesse, of sticking to our integrity of being there, of our desire to show up, work out, be with our family, create that as a proactive part of your calendar and stick to it. Great advice. Thank you for being on the show today. I know advisors, you know, we want to hear from others who are doing it well and who are being successful and still keeping their balance. That's what our whole new book, Balance Growth, is all about. Um, and that's, you know, a work in progress right now as we're interviewing, we've interviewed over 500 advisors for the previous book and we're working on the next one. So thank you for being a part of this, Jesse, moving this forward and, and, uh, really sharing with us your, your words of wisdom. Can I throw, can I throw one last thing into you please. Yeah, please on, on this? Yeah. So, so we spend a lot of time talking about what's important to life and for our clients, what's important in life for our clients, and how can we use the income and asset resources they have 
as a means to accomplish what's most important. It's not like whoever dies with the most wins. It's how are you using these things for the benefit of your family, creating those shared experiences and moments that you and I talked about before. So here's the thing. If, if we're going to be genuine and authentic in that thought process, we better be living that value system out loud in what we're doing every day. That's a great way to end it. And thanks again for being on the show. I couldn't agree more 100%. If you like this show, you love what's going on here, like, share, comment, subscribe, send this to someone who may need to hear what Jesse was talking about today. And, And thanks again, my friend. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a great day. And everyone, remember, live life on purpose.